Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, May 9th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm David Narkowitz, the chair of the school committee, and we'll begin by asking our clerk to call the roll call of the school committee. Did you come Present. 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 Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Susan Vaughn? Present. Oh my gosh. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, the issue that I have is. Um, I'm having a problem locating. Okay, so um, the first item on the agenda is I would like to ask um, Karen Jarvis Vance to come up to the podium. I know she's here with some of her staff tonight. Um, as we are today proclaiming National School Nurse Day, um, and I am having some technical difficulties with the proclamation. Um, so as I told you before, I am proclaiming it. It'll be issued virtually, um, and I will be bringing it to you uh, to present to you. But I wanted you to introduce your staff and, um, and, and uh, tell us a little bit about the importance of our nursing staff and the great work that you do every day in our schools. All right, thank you very much for that. And with me tonight, I'm not gonna say anything which is, I know, very surprising. Um, but with me tonight, I have Karen Schiaffo, who's the nurse at JFK Middle School. That's right. <laughs> Amy Avakian, who's our nurse at Leeds Elementary School. And Deb Raniak, who's our traveling nurse. And from here, I'm going to hand it over to Amy, who's going to say a few words. Thank you for the recognition of our important work and the opportunity to address you this evening. School nurses optimize student <coughs> and learning every day of the year. But on National <coughs> School Nurse Day, we take time to celebrate and recognize the contributions that school nurses are making to the health and learning of our nation's 50 million children. The number of students with complex physical and mental health conditions, along with the number of students at risk for health concerns, and students who are affected by societal issues, such as living in poverty, necessitates school nurses to use critical thinking and provide highly skilled, evidence-based practice that meets the needs of students, families, and school com communities. Currently, right here in Northampton, approximately 47% of our student body presents with some sort of special health care need. These range from the more typical asthma, allergies, and anxiety to much more complex needs such as insulin-dependent diabetes, cystic fibrosis, and cancer. We not only care for these students, but also manage routine visits for illness and injury for both students and staff. Additionally, so far this year, we have given 11,307 doses of medication, and about 13 of those were as-needed meds requiring a nurse assessment. Your school nurses handle it all to the tune of 26,236 health visits so far this year, and we return 94% of those students back to class ready to learn. And although managing the health office needs is the most important aspect of our role, we also serve on building crisis and student support teams. We are responsible for creating emergency evacuation plans for students with special needs and running medical emergency response drills. We help with 504 planning, perform communicable disease surveillance and response, provide puberty instruction to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, conduct mandated screenings, 4,358 of those this year, and collect data for the state that drives funding and, and planning for public health initiatives. I personally have been a school nurse for 10 years, but as a new nurse to the district this September, I can say that the support that we receive from the school district, and especially from our nurse leader, Karen Jarvis Vance, is extraordinary. We could not do what we do each day if we didn't have such a conscientious, kind, and innovative leader. Her compassion, sense of humor, and boundless energy are inspirational to her team every day. 
So that's just a snapshot of the work we do every day to help make school a safe and healthy place for our students and staff. Again, we appreciate your time this evening and thank you for your continued support for our health student programs. Thank so, you. thank you. And, um, I have actually, I've actually resolved the technical difficulties that I mentioned earlier, so I can read the proclamation. So I want to do that while you're here. So, um, so um, it's entitled National School Nurse Day, May 8th, 2019. Whereas students are the future, and by investing in them today, we are ensuring our world for tomorrow. And whereas families deserve to feel confident that their children will be cared for when they are at school, and whereas all students have a right to have their physical and mental health needs safely met while in, while in the school setting, and whereas students today face more complex and life-threatening health problems requiring care in school, and whereas school nurses have served a critical role in improving public health and ensuring students' academic success for more than 100 years, and whereas school nurses address the home and community factors, e.g. social determinants, that impact students' health. And whereas school nurses are professional nurses that advance the well-being, academic success, and lifelong achievements of all students by serving on the front lines and providing a critical safety net for our nation's most fragile children. And whereas school nurses act as, as a liaison to the school community, families, and health care providers on behalf of children's health by promoting wellness and improving health outcomes for our nation's children, and whereas school nurses support the health and educational success of children and youth by providing access to care when children's cognitive development is at its peak. And whereas school nurses are members of school-based teams, e.g. school health services, 504 IEP, disaster emergency planning, to address the school population. And whereas school nurses understand the link between health and learning and are in a position to make a positive difference for children every day. Therefore, be it resolved that the National Association of School Nurses celebrates and acknowledges the accomplishments of school nurses everywhere and their efforts of meeting the needs of today's students by improving the delivery of health care in our schools and offers gratitude for the nation's school nurses who contribute to our local communities by helping students stay healthy, in school, and ready to learn, and keeping parents and guardians at work, not just on National School Nurse Day, but at every opportunity throughout the year. And so now, therefore, I, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor of the City of Northampton, do hereby proclaim May 8, 2019 as National School Nurse Day and commend its observance to all of our citizens. Thank you all very much for the work you do. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Um, and we have uh, several people signed up this evening. Um, I'll call out your name and ask you to please come to the podium. I will have a three minute timer. Um, we just ask you to please respect the time limits so that everyone has an equal opportunity uh, to speak and be heard. Um, the first person who is signed up is Alicia Hackerson. time to speak. I have been the bilingual special education teacher at Jackson Street School since August 2000. It is an honor to work at Jackson Street School and until this year my work has been professionally rewarding. My work has been with students from kindergarten to fifth grade and an occasional preschooler. Some years have been challenging due, due to the needs of the students in my caseload until now. Even when very challenging students were in my caseload, I had the professional support and programs in place to do a good job and give these children the education that they need and deserve. As of August 2017, the educational model at the Northampton Public Schools changed. Programs that supported our students were dismantled, support personnel was reassigned to different positions, and each grade level was assigned one special education teacher to provide more inclusion services. I rem remained as the special education teacher for kindergarten for the 2017-2018 school year. This new model was very beneficial to our kindergarten at that time. We had no students with extreme needs and I was able to become a productive member with the kindergarten teachers. 
we were able to work with students with and without IEPs, giving children the extra support that they needed and avoid unnecessary referral to special education. I have to tell you that for the first time in so many years, I strongly believe that this year, we are not providing students at my grade level with education that they need and deserve. This was the case for first grade last year. This year, I have students who in the past would have been supported by one of our programs. Now we do not have those supports. This means that the school staff is expected to provide services that we are not structured to provide, and the children do not receive the education that they need and deserve. We lack the personnel to adequately serve these children. I believe I have been unable to adequately cover all services for all my students on IEPs due to the high demands of a few students. It has been nearly impossible for me to do much inclusion this year. I am also concerned that the support personnel are not receiving adequate support. From September until February, I spent most of my day supporting one student with severe behavior difficulties and was not able to provide many other services without interruption. At the present time, I spend most of my day supporting one student with emotional behavior difficulties outside and in the classroom and one hour with other <coughs> students. That leaves the kindergarten classroom without their special education inclusion teacher. It is very difficult to estimate the teacher-student ratio since the numbers alone do not mean anything. This has taken a huge toll on me and for the first time in my 19 years, I wake up in the morning and do not look forward to coming to work. It is sad to say that after so many years and so close to retirement, I'm presently looking for a job in another district. Hopefully a place where they value their workers and things do not get changed based only on the budget. Thank you for your time. The next person on the list is Kristen Picard. Hi and good evening. My name is Kristen Picard and I live in Holyoke, Massachusetts, but I've taught at JFK Middle School for the last seven years. I am here tonight after asserting each week that I would not speak. But after the school committee's negotiation subcommittee's last proposal, I can no longer remain silent. I stand here before you, before my colleagues, and before the city of Northampton to now assert that I find your most recent proposal around sick time unethical, inequitable, sexist, and downright disgusting. Let me tell you how we earn our sick time. We earn it by arriving to school 60 to 90 minutes early to prepare our classrooms for the activities that will occur. We stay late, sometimes past six o'clock, to write letters of recommendation, assess quizzes and essays, plan future lessons, email parents and students, plan field trips, or decorate a bulletin board with student work so our students feel proud every time they enter the room or hallway. We sacrifice baths and bedtimes with our own children. We come in before school on a sick day just to ensure plans are sufficient so our students get what they need even when we're not there. We attend the funerals of our students' parents and other loved ones in the evening or on a weekend. We leave our eight-week-olds with strangers because our maternity leave is a joke. We miss doctor's appointments for our sick parents because we're forced to pick and choose what's the most important and what can be missed. We spend our own money on the extras good pencils, pens, electric pencil sharpeners, extra Chromebook chargers, paper towels, tissues, hand sanitizer, desk cleaner, trays for organization, art supplies, and endless other supplies that help us run our classrooms efficiently and effectively. I am constantly forced to choose this city and my students over my family. I'm doing it as I speak. I was absent from dinner tonight with my son and husband. I will miss bath time and songs. I will miss bedtime, which will certainly mean that my toddler will cry for mama until he finally falls asleep. And I am missing this all tonight because of you. Because those of you sitting before me right now refuse to do the right thing. In fact, you have now revealed you have the means to do the right thing, but refuse to do so without taking away the benefits we have already earned. 
I think back to 2009 when my grandmother entered hospice at my mother's home. To grant her her last wish, my brother, mother, and I had to figure out how to provide 24-7 care for her at home. I was a new teacher in my district at that time and did not qualify for FMLA, so my principal sat me down and told me to use as much sick time as I needed to ensure my family's needs were met. I think back to 2012 when my father died and I arrived back to work the day after his funeral because it was an MCAS day and my district looked at me like I was some kind of superhero. I am forced tonight to ask myself if those experiences had occurred while I was an employee here, would I have been granted the same respect and accommodations? Based on the most recent proposal, no. I also have to go down a path that I don't travel on often. This offer of earning sick time is completely sexist. The fact that there are women before me who agreed to this offer is astounding. You all should be ashamed. But I'm unclear how the women before me can even look me in the eye. Based on your offer, particularly A1C, which notes full-time teachers who are not in their initial year of employment shall receive 1.05 days at the start of the school year for each full month they worked the prior year. I am certain that when you wrote this offer, you did so with the realization that any teacher needing to take an extended leave one year would be penalized the following year. I'm noting this as sexist as this will impact new mothers significantly, as those who need to take maternity leave will return the following year without adequate sick time. This is where my feelings turn to disgust. See, I had my first son in 2016. I only took a six-week maternity leave. I came back that fall having a three-month-old in daycare full-time and a mother who would spend the majority of 2016 and 2017 in the intensive care unit at Mass General in Boston, and yet I still only used six sick days that year. However, if forced to accept this disgusting offer from all of you, should I be in the situation again, I might not have those sick days available to me, at which point I'd have some decisions to make. Do I send my infant to daycare with some Motrin and hope for the best? Do I keep him home and not get paid for the day, impacting my ability to pay my mortgage? See, I used to think that your inability to offer me a fair wage was what was impacting my decision to have a second child, but now it's this. If I take another maternity leave, I will return the following year without adequate sick time for both myself and my child. And of course, new mothers are not the only ones who take extended leaves. There are employees with chronic illnesses or sick family members who will no longer have to choose between their job and their family as the choice will already be made for them, as they will be forced to abandon the care they or others need to be at work no matter what. I share these personal stories with you not to garner sympathy or pity, but to remind you that I am a person. I am a human being, as are the employees in the city. My stories are not unique. I am certain they share many of these experiences. So tonight, I will not ask you to dig deep into your pockets or bank accounts to do the right thing, but instead dig deep into your soul and stop looking at me and my colleagues as a data point or a deficit to your budget and start looking at us and treating us like the people we are. So the next person signed up is Joan Morvidelli. Good evening. My name is Joan Morvidelli and I live on Hatfield Street in Northampton and I'm a kindergarten ESP at Jackson Street. When I just started working first as an ESP in Northampton schools, it was November of 1989. I had been widowed in October of 89 and was now the sole parent to three elementary age school children, kindergarten, third and fifth graders, all at Jackson Street School. We needed to be there for each other and we needed health insurance. The ESP position was able to, to give me the coverage that I needed and the school hours that I needed to be able to be with my family. With the addition of my deceased husband's Social Security benefits, we were able to make ends meet until my youngest turned 16 and the benefits ended. Several years later, I had to sell our house and I currently live in a finished basement room in a dear friend's condo that I've known her for well over 45 years. Now at almost 67 years old, I am receiving some of my widow's benefits, which will go down to one third when I retire. Um, I, right now I've devoted most of my working life, close to 30 years, <coughs> caring for hundreds of five to seven year olds. Everything you could imagine they need, and I mean everything, including not, not even including the academics. You, anything they need, they need hugs from the, because their parents are gone out of town. Anything they need, fresh clothing. 
Um, this includes holding terrified children in a darkened room during an unplanned lockdown. Children who to this day give me hugs whenever they see me, and I would die for them. I've been capped at less than $19 an hour for more than 15 years, and my yearly pay before taxes is $24,000. This is disheartening, embarrassing, and as is the fact that our ESP positions were poised to be eliminated about two years ago. To know we were thought of so easily disposable has felt disrespectful and dismissive ever since. My job matters. We matter. We make positive differences every single day. Just ask the children we hold in lockdowns or the ones who have, we have had such tough beginnings. We keep in touch with them and we share their joy when they graduate from high school. We all have, we all have similar stories, every one of us. We care, we matter, and I keep hoping that all of you will recognize our value and do the right thing. Take care of all your Northampton School employees with fair working wages. Thank you. Woo! The next person signed up is Claire Ann Williams. Good evening, I'm Claire Ann Williams. I live at 21 Riverside Drive in Florence. <clears throat> and I'm back to speak one more time um, about something I already said, but it didn't appear to sink in. Um, I'm returning because I want to tell you this. If you want to retain the excellent teachers Northampton has, you must offer them a reason to stay. If you want to attract high quality teachers for vacant positions, you have to offer a reasonably competitive salary. Sal Canada's position will be filled next year and the offer on the table is right in line with the state average for administrators. This is not to say that the admins don't impact our students, but it simply cannot be compared to the work that these teachers do every day. Why is it, I can't ever figure this out, maybe it's because I'm a daughter of a union man, why is it that we value management so much more than the people who actually are doing what we are here to do, who have direct contact with students and parents and who impact their beloved MCAT scores? A representative of DESE asked us in our faculty meeting on Monday how we see our school in five years if everything was sunshine and roses. And it was pretty much presented that way. And many of us rolled our eyes because it's very hard for us to imagine if everything was sunshine and roses, certainly. It's a challenge. But here is my answer to sunshine and roses. If you don't have excellent gardeners, who will till that soil, plant the seeds, and cultivate the plants. You'll, all you'll have is undernourished plants that wither and go to the nearest charter school. The next person signed up is Jeremy Whalen. Okay. Um, the next person after Jeremy is Beth Brady. Hi there, I'm Beth Brady. I live in Hatfield, but I teach at Ryan Road. I've taught uh, Northampton for 26 years now. And, you know, I've, I just want to talk frankly. <laughs> and that is to say, I think that the, our offer is the lowest offer you're going to see, I'm hoping. And it amazes me that even what, what we've been offered, there's all these asks. I don't, you've already asked for so much from us. We've, we've tr gotten trained in um, responsive classroom. We've gotten trained in uh, the readers and writers workshop. We do all of the post, pre and post assessments. We work so hard <coughs> to grade them and <coughs> celebrate our students' growth. We um, have learned how to, to do the math recovery assessments, which teachers are doing one-to-one -one with our students so we can inform our instruction and help them learn more. 
You've already asked us to get all this training. We've done it. It's amazing training. You've, you've empowered us to do all this amazing stuff. We also have to do the sabers on our own time. We also have to do, this is just elementary. I can't even imagine what's happening at the middle and the high school, because I know there's, Northampton has just amazing teachers and staff, and I just don't get it. Why isn't it just sit down at the table and say, you want three, three, and three, and, and you know, and the step, raise the bottom and lift up the top. It needs to happen. We need more people coming in. We need to keep the people we have. I just, it just, and then to sit down and say, okay, you can have your three, three, and three, but you've got to give us this. No, you've already asked us for plenty. We're doing, we're doing so much. We care for each and every one of our students. We, we find their joy. We feel their pain. Like, it's just like, we're just here for your kids your kids pay us what we are worth or more you know gee willikers come on now <laughs> thank you the next person signed up is uh jesse pompey Mayor Narkowitz and members of the school committee. My name is my name is Jesse Pompey. I live in Williamsburg and I'm a teacher at Leeds. My oldest daughter is a fifth grader at Leeds, and my youngest daughter is a second grader in Williamsburg. To be honest, before this process started a few months ago, I didn't come to school committee meetings and I barely made it to NACE meetings. I was under this crazy false impression that things would happen fine without me. And what else, what else did they need me for? But once I was made aware of what was happening in our district, or in this case, not happening, I began showing up. And at one meeting, Andrea Gito came up to me. She looked me in the eye and she said, thank you for being here. Andrea saw me and I was seen, so thank you for seeing me. To the NACE negotiations team, who if those of you who are here or watching from home, I say thank you for being here. Thank you for being at every single meeting. Thank you for the sleepless nights. I get emails at all hours of the night and morning. <laughs> You're sending emails, you are organizing us, and you are getting us here. We see you. To the mayor and the school committee, I also want to say thank you for being here. You are elected, you were elected to be the governing body of the Northampton schools. There's a code of ethics for the school committee. It outlines three areas of a member's responsibility. One is community responsibility, two is responsibility to the school administration, and three is the relationship to fellow committee members. There's no direct mention of teachers. It says community. My hope, I'm an optimist sometimes, my hope is that that's implied, that we are part of that community. But right now, it doesn't feel like we are part of your community. It feels very much you versus us. Why? Why aren't we being seen? I am not sleeping well. I want this over. I want the NACE team who has worked so hard for us these past months to rest, to be with their families and be present and not be thinking about this. I want the school committee to come to the table with a respectful offer. This cannot happen again. I want to come to these meetings to hear about the nurses in our district and the innovative things that are happening that teachers and students are doing. I don't want to cry and hear people crying anymore. That's insane that I'm at this podium crying. It can't happen again. I'm not sleeping. Are you sleeping? If you go to bed at night content with this process, and what you've heard, you need to revisit those code of ethics that you were elected under 
And remember that elections are in November. Northampton will not forget who is interesting, interested in upholding your code of ethics to show community responsibility and who wasn't interested in that. This group of staff who is here and who is at home with their babies and their families, we are not content, we are not happy, but we are super strong, we are vulnerable, we are brave, and we are courageous. People are showing up, we are being seen, and we are here. Thank you. Thank you. person signed up is Garrett Adams. I'm Garrett Adams and I teach um, ESL and I've spent my whole life speaking, teaching three, four, five, and six-year-olds starting with my siblings, my own children who went through the Northampton schools, Clark School, preschool, and kindergartens in Northampton at both Bridge Street and Jackson Street schools. I really signed up tonight to make sure that you continue to hear stories, and I so thank my colleagues for their bravery and telling their stories because stories matter. Three, four, five, and six-year-olds are not data points. Your educators are not data points. The real reason, though, that I thought, you know, I actually do. There's some brand new information that was new to me just last week, but the research department of the National Educational Association released their statistics from 2018 on teacher pay and their anticipated 2019 uh, statistics in the schools. And the surprise to me really, what Massachusetts is now third in the nation in teacher pay. And I thought, wow, that's really great. And I'll get to saying why this is a really good pivot point for us to do the right thing. But the, the difference between Northampton pay and the Massachusetts average is significant. The states that we compare closely to are Indiana and Ohio, Wyoming, and Vermont, just to the north. New Hampshire does pay lower. Um, that difference in pay, and this is on a scale that says educational staff. So I hope in those other places that it includes my educational support professionals and my nurses, and when I as an ESL teacher or a classroom teacher have someone else working with my students, but the difference between that number three ranking for Massachusetts and Northampton is nearly $20,000. You can look it up. It's nearly $20,000. One more piece of information that's part of the reason this is a good pivot point. 60% of teachers are on the top step. More than 60% of educational support professionals are on the top step. You've heard what it's like to be on the top step and not move from many, many different perspectives. Trends in this country are not for baby booners to live to 200. You're not going to have 60% of your educators on your top steps all that much longer. This is a chance for you to respect the people who work with your children now. And when you have fewer people on your top step, your pay scale might be competitive and you might have teachers of color come from other states and other districts. You might have young people who start out loving children and working as educational support professionals in our district and go elsewhere. It's a really good time to do the right thing in every way possible and think about where can we get the funds from to do what's right and then go to the state and raise the level of education everywhere. Please do the right thing. And the uh, next and final person signed up is Andrea Egito. Good evening. I'm Andrea Egito and I am the NACE Unit A Chapter Coordinator. At the last meeting, the superintendent presented you with the data on the academic successes 
in our elementary schools based on our RTI program. Our educators did that. You walked through the halls tonight and saw the amazing artwork of our students. Our educators did that. Mayor, you just read a wonderful proclamation honoring our school nurses who work tirelessly and take care of every single person in our schools. I know that you all know the amazing work our educators do every day. And I know that you all care deeply about our schools. Thank you for that, because I know that you work really hard as well. We need to hear the voices of every member of this committee, not just one. We need the women on this committee to speak, to find their voices, because Northampton, where the women are stronger, but we don't pay them fair wages. We are a predominantly female profession and the lowest paid in this city when compared to the male-dominated professions. Right. At his budget talks, the mayor asked us to come to the table, not to negotiate on Facebook, and work together to come to an agreement. And then he would allocate the money. That's what he said. We came to the table. We respectfully sat there and took a wrist slap from this committee's lawyer because we walked out of negotiations. And then we dropped our proposal yet again. We still didn't get an agreement. You still said no. And we were still made to feel afraid, because that's what we do in female-dominated professions, for all of our employees, afraid that you might withdraw your offer to them. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think that you're trying to wear us down. Do you think that if you drag it out, we'll get tired? Because teachers know tired. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you want in our schools? Is that what you want? Is that going to keep our schools as amazing as they are? Or will you do the right thing this time? I hope it's the latter. Thank you. So that completes the sign-up list. Ms. Biggs, would you like to? Yes, OK. Um, so I, I re after I left last time, I realized that I currently, well, sorry, I don't currently, but I have taught eight of your children. And we'll teach some of them again, because they're not done. Eight out of I don't know how many, and some of them for three semesters. So Jasper, Aaron, Jacob, Anna, Emma, Zoe, Grace, and Adelaide. That's the eight of them. And I'm sure others in the past that aren't on the school committee anymore. But I'm here to read a, a note from Donna Brown, who's the only science teacher who's ahead of me in seniority. She wrote, why I waited for a fair wage. In the early 90s, Proposition 2 and a half limited the Northampton city budget, so I waited. The state funding formula was changed, meaning less state money, so I waited. Charter schools took more funds away from the city budget, so I waited. The economy tanked, and everyone took a hit, so I waited. We were given the choice of a raise, or staff layoffs, so I waited. Reasonably, a city needs a little more time to recover from that recession, so I waited. For more than 20 years, Donna Brown says, I've waited. How much longer do I need to wait? So I asked you last time also, if not now, when? I do appreciate, so I, I wrote a few things down this time, I do appreciate that you made some decisions to make small improvements to the salaries of some of our smaller units. But again and again and again, the size of Unit A continues to make increasing wages for that unit a financial <laughs> challenge. I've been researching many contracts around the state and many salaries have gone up by 2%. Your offer does nothing to close that gap. I'm hoping that you will be going to executive session. I'm glad to see one of our negotiators is here, uh, that you'll go into executive session after your meeting tonight, all of you, 
and that you will direct your two negotiators, one of whom I'm sure is at the high school watching uh, a production that her daughter is in and is in my class, and um, many teachers, I'm sure, or at least one, are helping make that happen after hours, I'm sure, not for any more pay. So I'm hoping that you'll go into executive session to make um, or to encourage your two negotiators to make a move higher and closer to uh, the requests of Unit A and not just shuffle the same old money around on fancy paper colored papers in hope we women will get bamboozled enough to choose one of them. <laughs> so an offer that doesn't decrease at the same time the other units to pit us against one another. Even if this requires the mayor to go back to the city for more funding as necessary, as he has already said he would do. So as I said before, if not now, when? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? My name is Evan LeBeau, for those who don't know me. I am a sophomore at NHS. I went to JFK and Ryan Road, where my mom teaches. I am a school of choice student. I am from East Hampton, but I wanted to come here. I wanted to be taught by the people that I have known my entire life, the teachers at Ryan Road that have known me longer than I can remember. I get frustrated when they have to do so much to help people like me and are not seen for what they do. That they are, they have to work so many hours on top of what the teacher's position is where they get paid for, but what do they get for it? They do it because they care about us. They care about me, they care about all the kids in this district like me. But you do nothing to reward them for that. The way you reward them is by giving them a fair wage. I am so grateful for all of them that come out and are, keep fighting for what they deserve. And I, I'll tell you that I've been coming to a bunch of these meetings and I'm not going to stop until you get give them what they should, deserve, what they need and what they sh definitely deserve. And I hope that you can see that students care. My, I talk about it every day with my friends. I make them listen to me here, <laughs> what their teachers, what their teachers get because not, be, not that many people outside this room or that work in this district know about it. And I'm going to do my best to change that. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Um, my name is Sharon Deal. I live at 57 Baker Hill Road. Um, yes, it's a new build, so it's uh, 5,000 plus new dollars for the city. Um, and I did live at 34 Vernon Street for 22 years where my side hustle was a land, I was a landlord. I rented the first floor and lived in the second and third with my two kids and my partner then. And um, that was my side hustle, and what I tried to do is rent that apartment always to a teacher. I rented my, part, my apartment to a teacher. I didn't crank the rent, which I could have done. I gave a fair rent to a teacher from the high school. A daughter was raised in that house, who now is at the high school and they lived there for 22 years. I feel like I gave back to the community. I started teaching here seven years ago. This is my, tw I'm in my 23rd year of teaching. Um, I teach special education kids. It's pretty exhausting. It's not the same group that I used to teach years ago. 
Um, and I'll tell you, what I saw when I, you guys gave us those pages, those white pages the other day, with the things that you wanted more from us, I could not believe some of those things on it. It was so insulting, just so insulting, some of those things. I, I came into this profession because I care about people and I have a big heart. I didn't go into the business world. I made a decision to not go into the business world. So those pages that you gave us were insulting. I am two years, hopefully, in June out of cancer. I'm, my cancer is in remission. I was diagnosed with cancer in February, two years ago. I had cancer in my leg. I continued to work. I worked. I started getting pain in September, and I was finally diagnosed in January. I had osteo, I had necroses in my femur. I could not walk. I went and bought a walker with wheels on it, and I wheeled myself around backwards from November until I left for vacation to go get chemo in February. Those papers, those white papers that you gave us were so insulting about the leave and about checking with the principal before. They, it's just like, I could not believe it. I go above and beyond for the, my job, for the kids I work with, above and beyond. I worked in so much pain. My femur, I have seven centimeters of no bone in my femur. And I kept working the last day before I left. And, and I did not have, I'm, I'm going to go over for a, little, a couple seconds. I here. sense that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I did not have, I, I was always healthy, always healthy. I never got sick, OK? <coughs> I never took a sick day, basically. And I was not a member of the sick bank. I was totally screwed. Totally screwed. I had to use all my days. Every single day I had to use. And then I lost about $5,000. And then I lost about $5,000 in I had to pay out of my pocket for insurance things that I could not cover. You know, I got a blood clot. So I got two blood clots. I got hospitalized. I mean, all kinds of stuff. I went through chemo. I went through radiation. All I could think about the whole time was, when am I going to get back to JFK? I emailed my kids the whole time I was out of work. I emailed them every week. I told them what assignments they were missing. I came in into the school as much as I could based on how healthy I was. And when summer, when I finished all my treatment, it was the end of June, all my radiation, I came back here in August and I started reading my caseload for the next year, August 1st. August 1st, I'm up in my classroom. I'm getting my classroom ready August 1st. I don't get paid. I'm getting my classroom ready. I'm reading my cases. I'm going in and looking at the big files. Who is this kid I'm going to be working on? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What's their family life like? I need to know everything about my kids before I start working with them, because connection is number one for me. And so to get those papers, I, it's just, it was so like, you know, thank God I could come back to work, but I had no time left. I had not a day left. Leslie let me I work, I worked hours testing kids, writing IEPs, so I could save my health insurance. I was going to lose my health insurance. I was going to have to go to COBRA. I, I did pay $75 of my health insurance because it kind of ran out. Um, but that's the situation here. You know, I, none of us are like really rich here or making it big, you know. We're just like dedicated to the kids we work with. And I'm dedicated every day that I work here. Um, I try my best. I look at myself. Um, I can live with myself. Um, so. I, I just, those, those 
things that you guys gave for the, like I said, those white pages with the list of things after getting an, an insulting comeback was just, it just felt more like the corporate world for me. It just didn't feel like heart. Heart is what I'm looking for. It just didn't feel that way. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing, I, I did ask at one point if I could be in the sick, sick bank. I did ask that. And I was told no. And, um, you know, I tell everybody now when they're hired, join the sick bank. But I just didn't even know I was ever going to be sick because I never got sick before. Um, so I, I guess that's all, that's all I have to say. I, you know, I, I understand, I understand the city is in a pickle and we don't have the money to some degree. I know there needs to be some changes. I feel like after listening to the mayor's presentation, I would like to join a committee. I would like to help out to figure out some other way. Um, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other people here that would want to join a committee to figure out some other way, some other creative way to figure out how to increase our salaries. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Yes, sir. My name is Ed Stone. Um, I'm new to the district this year. I'm a school adjustment counselor working at Northampton High School. I want to take a few minutes to talk about ESPs um, and the work that they do and the work that I see them do. So I work, I'm fortunate to work with an ESP named Paula. She's been in the district for tons of years and is super dedicated. Um, she used to work in audiology where she could make a lot more money than she's making right now. I met her the day before the school year started. And I met her because she was assigned to my room. This came after she had spent days of time and energy decorating another classroom where she thought she was going to be placed. She was told the day before school that she was going to be with me, different population, and she took on that challenge with an open mind and an open heart. Every day, Paula helps kids in terms of their learning. She goes with them and goes to classes when they wouldn't otherwise do it, but she does a lot more than that. And so I want to talk about some of the additional pieces that Paula does. She's known for sewing. That's one of the things she does. She's had kids come to our room and ask her if, they could pat if she could patch their jeans because they don't have enough money to buy new ones and they've ripped. She's aware of the fact that we don't have a culinary program anymore. So the kitchen that we had last year is now a storage room. So what Paula has done is she's brought in her grill, her foreman grill, and she's brought in crock pots, and she's made uh, wedding soup, Italian wedding soup. And she taught kids how to make homemade burgers so they could taste the difference between that and McDonald's. These are the kinds of things that she does on a regular basis. Kids confide in her, they talk to her, and they rely on her. I want to tell you a story about another ESP in a conversation that happened in my room this, this week, and I was shocked, as was this student. This student is a senior. He's been um, looking for work for a while, and he actually came to our room to get some help on applications. He recently got a job at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, and he's working in the food services program. He washes dishes, he delivers food, he does those kinds of things. This week he found out that he makes more than an ESP who he credits with getting him through his class last year. He doesn't have a high school diploma yet, but he makes more as a starting salary than our ESPs. I watched that conversation, I watched the shock on his face, and I watched that ESP take it in stride and keep working to help a student. That's a shame. That's embarrassing. It's good for him. I'm glad that he's able to have a living wage of $15 an hour as a 17-year-old kid. That's great. But we deserve so much more for the people who are here doing the work, who are molding our students to develop them to the point where they can go and get these kinds of jobs and still go to school. And these are people who need that kind of access and are reliant on people to help provide them with those opportunities and resources. And so when I saw that, that was shocking, and I hope that you think about that as you're having conversations about the offers that you're proposing, because that was really heartbreaking 
and for that student to recognize and start to actually understand how warped things are in this world and how undervalued and underpaid the supports that he credits with getting him through high school, he's about to graduate. The supports that he credits with getting him through high school are making less money than he is, and he just started this job like two months ago. So I hope that that is something that you consider, and I hope that you come back with an offer that really takes all of that into account. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Going once, going twice, okay. Thank you very much, everyone who spoke this evening. Um, next, we have announcements from school committee members. Are there any committee members who wish to make any announcements? Ms. Hennon, no, no. Mr. Moore. I just want to remind everybody that the NEF plant and garden sale is this Saturday from nine to one, there will be plants and various garden related things like tools and books and things, compost. And uh, I believe Smith Boak is, will be selling breakfast and lunch there as well. So it's nine to one. And yeah. Thank you. Ms. Hennessy. Uh, yeah, I'm just making an announcement that I'm not going to be seeking election for Ward 5 School Committee um, for the next term. Um, and I'd like to just take a minute to, if it, that's okay. Sure. Um, because someone, my neighbor said to me, you gotta tell people that it's a good gig. <laughs> and uh, and I, I will say that I'm, um, so this is a little bit extemporaneous and a little bit not, but I've been really committed to public schools and public education for most of my life. I'm a product of um, public K through 12 schools. Um, so, and a teacher for um, 22 years. Special Ed, um, AP, IB, uh, Supervisor, Social Studies. Um, I've taught everything in the, in the Social Studies Department, I think. Um, and I really hate US 10, so sometimes I, I get ornery when we're talking about history. Um, I'm a first generation college student, so I feel like I'm, I'm, um, I'm an example of why public schools are the great equalizer. Um, and I believe that. And so. Five years ago, I ran for school committee. I'm usually not a crier, which is really funny right now. Um, <laughs> um, because I wanted to kind of do more upstream work, and I wanted to do more for my community and for my kids. Um, so I actually want to say that it's been an unbelievable honor to work with this group of people, including Dr. Provost and Annie and Cammie and Candy and Laura and Tracy. And, um, and I don't think the public sees that it's kind of the nature of the beast here. We sit here and we're kind of like taking it, we can't say things. And, um, but these are some of the most amazing, brilliant, committed people who believe with their entire heart that public education is the foundation of our democracy and it, and it is the great equalizer. And I can't believe how amazing these people are. Uh, you know, subcommittee meetings, we go to school events, um, we have other, you know, other jobs with families. It is tireless. Um, it, and sometimes thankless, but I don't think anyone cares about that. I mean, sometimes it's nice to be thanked, but generally that's not why anything, I think anyone is in it. It's really about doing work for the kids, for our staff, for our community. Um, and it's hard work, but it's really rewarding work. And so that's why you should, you know, that's why I recommend it. Um, and it's, and democracy is so messy. It is messy and it is slow moving. Um, but I've been really proud of this work of this committee um, for the five and a half or whatever years I've been on. Um, it's hard and we make mistakes, um, but I really encourage anyone to run in Ward 5. Please contact me if you want to talk or any of the, the other members. Um, you know, we talk a lot about commas and technology and hyphens, but we also talk about like technology and budgets and it's heartbreaking sometimes. I think you probably know this. Um, so I've been honored to work with you. I have seven more months. I'm gonna, you know, I think I'm gonna miss a meeting for my son's birthday, but um, I've missed one meeting in my five and a half years. Uh, I love it. I encourage anyone, please contact me. And again, thank you all. And I'm sorry, I took way more time and way more tears. I usually make jokes, I don't cry, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yep. Are there any other announcements? Uh, Ms. Fallon. 
the student production of Show Angel, Snow Angel, sorry, in the auditorium um, tomorrow at 7 p.m. at the high school, Saturday at 2 p.m. Um, and also Saturday at 7 p.m. Um, the NHS Art Showcase um, runs May 2nd through 29th at Forbes Library, um, but the community is invited to a reception tomorrow night um, during Arts Night Out. It will be between 5 and 7 p.m. Um, and then the K through 8 art show will be running May 10th through the 31st, and tomorrow is also the opening reception for that here at JFK um, from 4 to 6 p.m. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, we'll move into the um, recommended actions of the school committee. Um, we have two items, uh, actually one item on the agenda, I believe, on the consent agenda. Is that correct? Okay, it's one item on the consent agenda. It's the approval of the field trip um, for the JFK Hybrid Huskies going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut, June 4, 2019. We had a set of minutes on the consent agenda, but those are not ready for this meeting. So the, the consent agenda would just involve that one field trip approval. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. Um, I note that our student representative is not here this evening. Um, and so we'll move on to the update of uh, the day on the Hill. Um, several of our members uh, were on Beacon Hill uh, last week. Um, and so we wanted to just have an update on that. And, I, and I'll turn it over to our legislative liaison uh, to speak about that. And others who are with her can join in. Uh, Ms. Busansky. Thanks. Uh, so last Wednesday, Ms. Fallon, Mr. Kaufman, Ms. Burnham, and myself all went to the mask day on the hill to um, advocate for more money from the state. And um, I guess I, I found it very disheartening, so I don't have a lot to say about it. I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. I don't see how it's going to work out. But um, well, we talked about the millionaire's tax. We talked about the Promise Act. We talked. Uh, we heard from a lot of our uh, the chair and vice chair of the committees on education. Um, Representative Aaron Vega, who's really fighting the good fight. I know that, and that was really um, great to hear. And I thought the turnout from mass from school committee members was really high, and I think that's really important because, um, to me, the greatest takeaway was really that we have to, as though we haven't been, you know, yelling loud enough, we have to yell even louder, and they need to hear even more voices. I guess it isn't volume; it's really quantity, it's breadth, and that's what we heard. Uh, Senator Comerford, especially, talked to us about how a lot of her uh, other represent other senators are not hearing anything from their districts at all. So um, somehow, as we need to work um, harder and um, to kind of bring more people into this um, and make it a real echo chamber that um, what we're getting from the state is insufficient and we need more. And what we know is from the legislation, what it's looking like right now is that we're really um, on the road to getting even less from the state at the end of the day um, right now, thanks to how lots of other things play out. And um, so I guess I just really wanted to put a plug in for um, the Fund Our Future event. It's a week from today, the 16th, 4.30 p.m. on the steps of Springfield City Hall. And I um, hope that as many of us can go, can go, will go. Um, we also put in a request to, um, with both Senator Comerford and um, Representative Sabato so that, you know, when there's opportunities for us to advocate, when they need us to really send those emails, that they give us that heads up so that we can all really join together, which I know we've done, and um, to really um, have our voices heard. And I think that is a real difference from in this kind of new legislative team we have in our area, that they really are calling on us very loudly and clearly and, clearly and communicating with us to, um, to step up and you know email, write letters, all the work, um, show up, all that work. And uh, we just need to, I think, turn up the pressure even more. That's all I can really say. So there's my. But I invite Mr. Kaufman, Ms. Fallon, if you want to add anything. Ms. Fallon? Please um, do. Yeah, I guess two things. One is um, I really, so Senator Jason Lewis, uh, when they passed the Senate Ways and Means budget, um, posted a very excited post on Facebook um, 
about how this is the highest level of funding you know we've had and seen in 20 years and i just want the public to understand that that we're likely not going to see an increase at all in northampton and we may see a loss so i don't want people to think that we can be complacent um, our funding levels are really abysmal um, and th it's those sort of headlines that we see in you know in local in newspapers and on facebook that can be misleading. I'm sure someone's benefiting from these higher funding levels. I think they're also not acknowledging that costs have just risen. Um, but I think that we need to always be conscious of how legislation's affecting us here in Northampton and be ready to advocate for that. Um, and I also, I know that we are all pushing really hard for um, the Fund Our Future campaign and for um, passing the Promise Act, but I, one of the other agenda items that was on the legislative priorities was that charter school funding piece, which is so important for Northampton. Um, for FY 2019, the state legislature funded at 56% of what they're supposed to. Um, and that's actually really having a bigger impact on us in Northampton right now. And so we really, I asked uh, Representative Sabadosa to please follow um, the House Bill 418 that the mayor had gone to Boston and testified, but we really need to get um, to get some sort of motion on the, to the charter school funding because that's actually going to really make the difference for Northampton, I think, and and it's very important to not lose sight of that piece of it. Mr. Kaufman. The office said to I mean I, I Rebecca and I carpooled and I think we were kind of felt feeling pretty glum afterward. But um, two positive things. One I would say my opinion and I don't you guys speak to this if you share this idea, but I think that we're incredibly well represented between Senator Hummerford and Representative Sabado. So we really felt like preaching to the choir. They they're really busy, but education seems to be a really high priority for them. They've done a lot of work in this area. They were very receptive to us. Um, and they were both, the common thing they were both saying is make us make change. Blame us. Tell us what we need to do. Strive for, you know, making us uh, make sure we can't say no. And it wasn't those two. They were speaking in general like this needs to rise to the top of people's priorities. Um, but I just felt, I left leaving feeling really good about the people we have serving us. Um, the second thing, and I, I forget which one brought it up, um, maybe both of our representatives, but um, the idea was that there was a commitment, I, I think, from the Leader of the House to talk about revenue, to meet and discuss revenue, and the feeling I got the way it was presented to us was that's relatively new, that there was a commitment to do so and an openness to discussing different ways of generating revenue that we might not have uh, been, that might not have been as receptive in the past, including a couple of ideas that Senator Comerford spoke about, about local revenue generating. Mayor Narquitz, I'm sure you've spoken to her. And so that sounded somewhat promising that maybe uh, amidst the greater formula, which may not benefit Northampton as much, maybe the state as a whole will be, will be generating some more revenue. So trying to put a positive spin on what was not a particularly exciting day um, in terms of optimism for the future, but I think Rebecca did a great job summarizing. And who else was with you? Was Ms. Burnham? Yeah. Oh, okay. She's at the show tonight. Okay. Yes, Ms. Hennessy. I really don't know the answer to this because I know I have an in on this topic. <laughs> but I, it feels to me that when our community is writing letters, we really have to write to the chairs also, not just Cum uh, Senator Cumberford and uh, Sabadosa. Is this because yeah. it yeah. seems like the House yeah. Peich is not is a little bit eh? And when I say eh, I mean she's not not supportive of money. Right. Yeah. So yeah. No, I think it's true. I think we have to expand our list. It's not just about our senator and our rep, but it's about the education Cause, committees. Because they need to, they're from Winchester and Wellesley. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a real different community. Mm -hmm. And they need to hear, I think, from our community that mm -hmm. um, we're not Winchester and Wellesley. Um, yeah. And so I, I would really urge our community members to <coughs> make sure they're including the chairs of those committees. Um, and both um, the Senator and the and Representative Sabadosa mentioned that it was important to include um, the Speaker of the House, DeLeo, on it too because he wasn't hearing from anyone um, and that that was important. And that's not something we had done. We've been including um, Representative Peich and Senator Lewis on our correspondence, but not DeLeo, so it's worth a try. Okay. Any other um, 
Any other discussion about this? Thank you to our colleagues who made the trek to Boston. I've I've made it myself many times, and I it's it's um yeah it sometimes is not as productive as you hope. So, but oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Meyer. I'm just you know I'm just curious because Western Mass. <clears throat> It's very hard to get money to flow east at all, and certainly past Worcester. And when I looked at the House vote of 154 to 1, the question I ask myself is, when you have a speaker who has said session after session that revenue is off the table, and even the revenue is, that's proposed is, um, again, it, it took the Senate to come forward with additional revenue measures this time, and of course they always have to find a way to claim that the items that they're amending are finance related because they can't originate any. Um, where are the dissidents? I mean, one representative from Mattapan voted against the budget, objecting to the way that it is basically hashed out behind closed doors yeah. and then voted on as bundles of amendments with no ability for members to weigh in. And that is the way it's been done, and that's the way it will continue to be done. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just, again, Representative Kokot was the head of the Progressive Caucus in the House, and you know, a very able legislator. We had the President of the Senate as our representative. And I guess my concern is, on, you know, when when are those people who are outside of the leadership going to begin to stand up and say, even with symbolic votes? And I understand that when you're an individual legislator you can get your district's earmarks threatened. Um, you know, you will be coerced. But um, until we do that, I don't see how we're taking the first steps. Um, you know, again, because these promises have been made for a long, long time, and they have not come to fruition so far. Thank you. Any other discussion? OK. Thank you again to our colleagues. Um, the next item on the agenda is a vote. Uh, this is something we um, typically ask for toward the end of the fiscal year. Uh, this is to authorize the superintendent to exceed the $10,000 transfer restriction um, to be able to close out our fiscal year books as we move into the uh, final uh, two months, uh, one and a half months of the fiscal year. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Any questions or discussion on this? Hearing none, all those. I have a oh, question. sure. It says to exceed 10,000, um, and maybe it says in here somewhere, but how much are we exceeding 10,000 by? What this means is that I will be able to transfer more than $10,000 as needed in order to cover deficits in accounts with surpluses in other accounts and to spend down all of the accounts altogether. So um, it's individual transfers, some of which may be a lot more than $10,000, some of which may be just over $10,000. It's basically, we have reached the deadline for ordering in the district, so there's no more um, ordering allowed in FY19. And at this point, we need to start um, taking care of the deficits we currently have on the books and spending down to make sure we end the year with zero and no counts in the negative. And can I just ask a follow-up question? So I understand a lot of that, but is there, maybe we're just not allowed to have a surplus period, so the we're goal not. is you have to spend everything. What would we do if we did have a surplus? It would revert to the general fund. And then Northampton would have that in the future, but all the other city departments return their surplus to the city. We don't require the school department to do that, okay. and typically the school department spends it's in, tries to spend its entire general fund, and that's how you have the ch school choice funds that create okay. your reserve account. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, and again, this is all money that's already been appropriated. It's not like new money that's being appropriated. It's the money we 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 appropriated already. It's just moving it between line items. I understand, and I'm I'm just assuming you're buying things that are needed for next year, so that they don't hit next year's budget, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that um, that vote is passed. The next item on the agenda is a uh, report on Global Glimpse from Jeremy Whalen. 
Hi everybody, Jeremy Whalen. I'm gonna make this quick because it's eight o'clock and I'm usually staring down the barrel of nachos and beer at Arizona Pizza Company for trivia. So, uh, Global okay. Goals, excellent program. I was put onto it by Nat Reed, who, a former uh, school committee member. And uh, what it is is an international trip, but also a leadership program uh, by a for, uh, NHS alum uh, that is a way to offer an international trip, look at things like uh, global poverty and uh, globalization and things like that in work in monthly workshops we started in January uh, that lead up to a kind of service learning trip uh, that are going to go to three countries um, this summer Panama Ecuador and the Dominican Republic wow. we have 14 juniors they were nominated by their teachers and uh, they were put through an application process and chosen for this program uh, on the student side, like I said, it was a it's a work it's a monthly workshop. They're three hours uh, three hours long, and we talk and, and discuss uh, a whole bunch of different uh, topics, uh, ranging from leadership to globalization to global poverty. On the advisor side, uh, I've been working with a uh, a cohort of advisors from uh, from um, Springfield, from Westfield, and from Greenfield. Uh, and we put in over 20 hours of uh, preparatory work into all of the um, all the things that go into an international trip and all of the things to expect both from uh, protocol in this it, for our schools and working with that and for a global glimpse uh, for po uh, policy as well. Um, I, what, uh, a couple of things that I just want to I, I sent you a whole ton of information uh, handbooks for each one of the trips policies uh, FAQs etc. Uh, but the things that I wanted to highlight, um, one, um, the, uh, the safety of the trip. Safety is obviously the number one concern for us. Uh, there's, uh, um, the students uh, will, they actually give their self, this is one of the cool things, um, they were all shocked about this, try to find loopholes, but the students give their cell phones for the trip and they're placed in a safe. The advice, just a clarifying thing, because I know that the superintendent had a question about this. Um, there is always 24-7, a cell phone on the uh, the advisors, both the adv the Global Glimpse leaders, that would be me and the advisors, as well as the program coordinators, the in-country logistics and uh, the, the kind of tour guides and ed educators there, we collaborate together. Uh, there is a direct line to both the Global Glimpse uh, uh, coordinators here in state, as well as a 24-hour hotline to, uh, to uh, medical services. Um, a, big, uh, a lot of protocol that goes involved if there was ever an emergency that, that there's 24-7 uh, access as well as um, a, a chain that, it, that gets stuff set off to notify parents immediately. Uh, the, the anecdote that <coughs> reassured me was there was a student, a student that had uh, uh, pancreatitis down in, in one of the countries immediately within 24 hours. Uh, family was notified, family was actually flown because of the, the, the health, ins the, the travel insurance down to be with that, to, to be in country with, with, their, um, with their child. Uh, the second thing is the, um, the education that I've received through the, the, the program. Like I said, it's been 20 plus hours of workshops dedicated to all the kind of worst case scenarios as well as just what the, the daily itinerary will be and how to kind of navigate throughout the country. Uh, and third, that it is um, an educational opportunity. It's not just an international trip, but it's a leadership program. We've been meeting for three hours a month. Uh, and the, uh, the last thing is the um, equitability of the trip. Uh, students, uh, it's, it's a sliding scale of payment based on uh, economic, uh, e economic needs and issues. Uh, and so students, we have students ranging from paying the full price, all inclusive for the two weeks, 4500 all the way down to $400. Uh, and so the, um, the students have helped each other as well uh, raise funds and go out and, um, and do kind of charitable efforts to, uh, to, to pay for that as well. So I think it's an all around excellent program so far. This is my first year doing it. Uh, and um, if you have any questions, I'll open it up. Thank you, members. Do you have questions? Is this, can I just ask, is it through a company? Is like, what's the- Yeah, so it was a nonprofit organization. Like I said, it was started um, by an NHS alum. Okay, so it's called Global Glimpse. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, Mr. Moore. Yeah, I'm just curious. Where does the subsidy come from? It so it's actually it, it's so there's a lot of different uh, uh, partners in it. United is a is a partner who pays for the tickets. So actually, all the tickets are paid for right then. 
Um, the, uh, it, it is a 501c3 this book that has a couple of different um, locations from San Francisco to New York so and from raising. here. So yeah, it's, it's ch a, a, a large, um, the majority of that subsidy is coming from charitable donations. But recruited, so the donations are solicited by Global Glimpse as opposed to There by is a Cuts. small, so the, that, the, so at the, at the low end of the scale, so that $400, it was, it's, it's um, part of the training is for um, the, the students working to go out, be ambassadors, and, and, and uh, donate some uh, charity themselves. Uh, we haven't had any issues with payment. Uh, if, if a student could not pay for the trip, we've, um, we've talked to the NEF and some other uh, organizations locally, um, the, uh, as well as with families if there was a, if there was a need. We haven't had that, that need, but it, it's not, um, it, it's also, there are other avenues in which if a student had missed a payment or something, there's, there's different ways to get that as well. Ms. Fallon? The, um, I was just interested to know, so reading through all the curriculum, um, so for instance, they go to a farm or a ranch one day and talk about sustainability and fair trade, and then another day they would go to the dump or to, the, to teach English. Is, so is that all of that, all of those different aspects are incorporated into the one trip? Is that what it is, or is it? Yeah, um, I, I, would, I would encourage you to look at the, uh, the sample itinerary, because it is, it is um, the days are very intense. This is, uh, they have two free days and that's just chunks of time, but otherwise from, I think, I believe it's about 8 a.m. to 8, 9 p.m., their, their entire day has an itinerary and they're kind of constantly in the service, service learning um, uh, kind of agenda for the day. It's, 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 really, it's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's, it, 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 like, like I said, it's not uh, just go around, snap pictures here, snap pictures there. Great educational opportunity there as well, but um, it's a very kind of um, strictly um, to the to the agendas that they have for the day. Well, th yeah, it looks amazing. I hope that you'll let us know. Yeah, I'll be snapping the pictures the entire time. I know you've time. been a driving force behind this, and and I think it sounds amazing. Are there any other questions for Mr. Whalen? Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, first, thanks very much for doing this. This sounds pretty outstanding. Um, so I apologize, you might have said this in the beginning, but there's three different destinations, but each student goes to just one, is that right? Yeah, so we, so we have 14 students. So f uh, I believe five are, are going to be traveling with me, and then the other uh, nine are going to be traveling to other countries. We have Corey checked all the, all the global goods leaders and everything. We've gone through the entire process of, of field trips and everything there. Um, on our end for, for our school as well. Um, as well, in, in, in addition to that, they, um, their, pa their parents have been, there's uh, meet parental meetings before the trip, so pre-trip parental meetings, where they're all briefed and, uh, and as, as a, an advisor, I, need, I am required to reach out to all of the individuals, not only at Northampton High School, but all of the students that will be traveling with me Yep. And, ha and establish a connection there right. as well. Thank you. Um, and so you'll be the only person from our district on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Um, and then how old are the kids? How old? Yeah. They're juniors. Okay. Yeah, juniors. Great. Thanks again. Yeah. So um, it, there wasn't, it wasn't on the agenda, but I think, I think I'd be comfortable if we, if we could um, have a motion to just approve and endorse this field trip, because it is a trip out of the country. And I don't know that we've endorsed it before previously. So I think that would be helpful just to do that. Um, so you can go off to Arizona Pizza and do your trivia. Um, so <laughs> make sure before first round. Could someone make a motion? Motion to endorse the Global Glimpse trip. This trip. Yes, OK. Um, is there a second? second. OK. Any discussion? Can, can I do sure. a question? Is this, this sounds great. Has this been looked at through our lawyers and like this is all good in terms of well, it's in risk? It's interesting that you asked that question because that's how it comes here. If you look at the materials within the um, packet, Global Glimpse um, bills itself as a non-school sponsored yeah. activity. And so um, at one point early on in the process, Mr. Whalen and I were debating whether or not it even required school committee approval. Mm -hmm. But I think what happened with the course of this is it sort of lapsed over into school sponsored uh, activity 
territory. Um, the day after we had our conversation, I went up to the high school and saw a big global glimpse poster hanging outside the principal's office. Um, I later found out there was a meeting held for parents in the high school. And so I consulted with Layla and felt that it would be best to handle this as an international travel um, process via our field trip policy. And so that's what we've done. And he, as he said, um, all of the chaperones have been quarry checked. All the rest of the parts of our policy have been complied with. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I will add also in doing so, I've probably put in about eight to 10 hours of paperwork that's redundant paperwork for the parents, but is information for, for all of you. So we, we dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and um, multiple, thank you <laughs> to the superintendent for um, getting me out of this kind of purgatory of is it not, is it, and we, he, he met with me and I, and I thank you for that as well. Okay. So, um, so there's a motion made and seconded to uh, the school committee that endorses this trip and thank you Mr. Whalen for going on it. Um, which country are you going to? Ecuador. Ecuador, awesome. Okay. June 29th. Okay. You went before to Ecuador, right? Uh, no, I've been to Venezuela and Colombia. Excellent. Okay. All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda, uh, we have a series of donations. Um, the first one is a donation to the JFK PTO to help fund the sixth grade trip to the Connecticut Science Center for $2,700. Motion to approve the, uh, let's, uh, can we, did you want to speak to it? No, anyway. we the information. So, great. So, motion to accept the donation, JFK PTO, fund the transportation for the sixth, sixth grade trip to Connecticut Science Center. Is there a second? second? Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the next item on the agenda is a donation. This is the lead school PTO um, uh, providing transportation for a fourth grade field trip. Ms. Lampa, did you want to? Uh, did you want to go back one? There's actually two JFK PTO. Sure. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I saw JFK and just went right past it. Um, so uh, it's actually, this is another JFK PTO to fund uh, the Student of Color Association trip to the wa to Washington, D.C. for $3,000. Make a motion to accept the gift of the JFK PTO fund for um, SOCA trip to Washington, D.C. in the amount of $3,000. Second. 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 Okay. Second. I, I have yes. a question. I, I just, I'm fine with this. I think it looks great. The only concern I had was the Airbnb. Um, and it, this looked fine because it was a standalone. No one else was living in the Airbnb. But I, I, it just, it was on my radar that if other field trips use Airbnb, um, I just have some concerns. So I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. I, this looked legit. I looked through the whole site and it looked like a lovely place and no, the, the owner wasn't <laughs> going to be there. But I think in the future, I just, there's a little bit of a, a alert sign for me for Airbnb. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure how DC is regulating or to what level they're regulating. Yeah. DC, uh, a lot of major metropolitan areas now have their own yeah. like local regulations. So I don't, I don't know about DC, but um, I know we're working on it in Massachusetts. So, um, but a good point. So yeah. It looked great, but that was the only thing for the future. I think we need to just mm -hmm. be aware of. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was a motion made. Was there a second? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other discussion on this one? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, um, now we'll get to the lead school PTO uh, donation. Uh, this is for transportation for a, a fourth grade field trip, um, uh, $1,122.46. I don't know where the field trip is to. Maybe Ms. Lamica can tell us, but maybe not. Uh, so I'm just looking on the form here. That's for the field trip and the consent agenda. Oh, okay. So it's the Science Center trip. Oh. <laughs> No, no, it can't for be. the hybrid oh, okay. Yeah, that, uh, it's, it's, it's also the science, science center. center. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Another science center trip. Okay, so um, is there a motion? Yeah, make a motion to accept the lead school PTO in the amount of $1,122.46 for transportation for the fourth grade field trip. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion on this one? All in favor, please say aye. Uh, All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that gift, along with the others, is gratefully accepted uh, by the school committee. 
The next item on the agenda is a report from our rules and policy subcommittee. And we have um, a, several uh, first reading and some second reading on various policies. And I'll turn it over to the chair of the committee. Thank you. Um, just, yeah. There is some confusion on this. Everything's going to be a first reading with the exception of the graduation requirements policy IKF. So. Um, so the first policy we'll be discussing, it's a first reading, it's policy GBEBD. Um, it's a new policy, it's um, referring to online fundraising and solicitations or crowdfunding. Um, we received um, an advisory opinion from the Ethics Commission um, and um, the MASC also recommended that we have a policy surrounding um, online fundraising and solicitations. Um, I think that uh, there are a few things that we tried to address in this, um, some of it being uh, protection of student privacy to make, to make sure that um, no students' images are used um, in setting up the fundraising, um, and that there's an understanding about what happens with um, campaigns that don't reach their goal and that the money needs to be returned and who the property belongs to. Um, after the fundraising is done. So this tries to address all of the issues that were brought to our attention by um, the advisory statement. I don't know if anyone had questions or. Makes sense. And, and I know one of the issues we had in the past was people would start campaigns on our behalf without actually our authorization. So that, that, does that get addressed in here? Yes, it does. Um, so it has um, the principal of each school approving um, fundraising activities within their building, um, and then the um, superintendents approving fundraising for the district as a whole, and that um, when employees are soliciting technology or software that they need to have approval of the, um, of the chief information officer or designee prior to that so that we kind of have an idea of what technology is coming in and out of the school. Um, and at the national level, this was actually a com um, an issue at the conference at the National School Boards Association conference because there were um, very well-meaning campaigns started that actually didn't comply. Also, they were either in violation of FERPA or in violation of the Individuals with Disability Education Act because they were asking for things that by law, federal law, had to be provided by the district. And so, yeah, it was really just trying to address all the potential concerns. Um, so that is the first reading and we'll Are there be any other questions about this on first reading okay 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 so you'll see that next month um, for a vote and then um, next up this is a second reading it is policy IKF graduation requirements um, I am a little sheepish to admit that I couldn't read my own handwriting so I went back and watched the video to see all of the objections that were raised um, last time we looked at this policy. So I hope that I've addressed them all. Um, you should all have received um, in your packets the um, requirements that I think address everything that was brought up um, at our last meeting. So I'm just going to read through them and um, then if you have any questions. So in order to graduate from Northampton High School, a student must have earned 28 total credits. Course requirements are the following. Four sequential English classes for four credits, three history courses, three credits, three mathematics courses, three credits, three science courses, three credits, two additional courses from the following subject areas, math, science, social studies, English or world language, two credits, one visual or performing arts course, one credit as designated in the program of studies to be effective for the class of 2020. 22 and subsequent classes, four learning experiences to be taken in grades 9 through 12. These must include wellness one for which one credit will be awarded. And then with the explanation of the history requirements for the class of 2020 through 2022, three sequential history courses, three credits, which must be world history one, world history two or the honors AP European equivalent, US history two or the AP equivalent. And then for the class of 2023 and subsequent classes, three sequential history courses, three credits, which must be U.S. History I, U.S. History II, or the AP equivalent, World History, or the Honors AP equivalent, um, and that students must have passing scores and MCAS tests as required by the Massachusetts State Department of Education. 
Students must have been enrolled in an approved public or independent school for at least four years after the completion of eighth grade with the final year at Northampton High School. So this is not the policy that the subcommittee passed. This is incorporating the changes that we made. I'm not sure um, how, how it's easiest to proceed. If I, I say you, I I'd like to make a motion to um, approve policy IKF as amended with, these with all of these revisions I just read. Did you have a question, Dr. Provost? Yes, I do believe one thing got dropped in the translation is the last bullet point. I think it should say for health-related learning experiences. So I'll offer that as an amendment to the amended um, to change the last bullet point to for health-related learning experiences. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of accepting that amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So back to the main motion. Any other questions about these? Ms. Uh, I, have, I do have a question. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the history again where I get um, <laughs> For the class of 2022, we had a discussion about the world history, the AP European is equivalent, okay? And we had a discussion about U.S. history. There's an AP U.S. history. However, for the next grouping, we... It, the AP equivalent, there's no AP world offered at the high school, that, um, Principal Lombardi said. So do we, are we saying it's the European for the world there? Or are we just going to ill-define it and just say AP equi equivalent and someone will, whatever. That's what we're doing. Great. That's good then. It was kind of leaving it open. Good. That's so. Mr. Kaufman. So thank you for this. I trust that you've done the research and I, this is all accurate, but I just, I just had a couple of questions. That's your job to verify. It, well, it does seem to have changed a lot from last time. So one of, one of the things I noticed is that wellness too has, is no longer a requirement. So that's true. We don't, we don't require that. That is correct. Yeah, I, just to be clear, I did. not So not only did I go back and listen, yeah. then I did send the proposals. We spoke with Dr. with Dr. Provost and Mr. Lombardi, and then I also sent this to um, um, Karen Hidalgo, the guidance counselor at the high school, and to Brian Lombardi um, to make sure that it was, um, I asked them to if it was clear, accurate, and in alignment with the program of studies um, that we, and, and so this was, Yes, it has been vetted. I'm hoping it's accurate. I so, so then when we now have, like last time we spent a little bit of time talking about this, this bullet, which was two additional courses or learning experiences, and we debated that and back and forth. So um, and now it's pretty clear. I, I think it's pretty clear for four learning experiences to be taken, one of which must be wellness. So can you summarize how did that how did that change all of a sudden from, did we have a misunderstanding previously that there had to be only certain courses in just two? This seems like a big change from what was in the, what was in the previous one. Previous one said two additional courses or learning experiences, et cetera. You, yeah, you so that, that language in the prior version of the policy goes yeah. back to the time that we were aligning with the state requirements in PE. Yeah. And so all of the courses that were listed under that bullet are courses that are covered in the frameworks for health education. The actual practice has been that no students are taking that in order to satisfy their, their health requirement. What they're actually doing is taking wellness one and then taking three additional learning experiences in grade 10, 11, and 12. So this more active reflects mm -hmm. what people are doing. Is this That's what right. we want? It's what we want. Okay. <laughs> so what does forward learning experiences mean then? Is that a, just, can you summarize again what that means and does it need to be in here? So one of them is wellness one. Um, other types of wellness experiences that students have done have been hiking on Mount Tom, going to Berkshire East. Um, they've been basically movement activities that introduce students to leisure activities they may do after they graduate from high school. So it's been a while. I think this might have been different when my kids were in high school. So how do students know what a learning experience is? Is this in the student handbook? Is it, how do they? I don't think that learning experience is defined anywhere in the handbook. I know that the PE department is in charge of organizing the experiences for the different classes. And so then they say, okay, this is the day that sophomores are going to Mount Tom or whatever. Wow, this is really different. Ms. Foss, did you have a I'm, similar question? I'm going to just help with this a little and maybe make a <laughs> suggestion for making it more clear. Um, it's um, Thank you. I think it 
I think it did capture our conversation and yet maybe we can continue to add a little bit. Um, I would wonder if this bullet might just say wellness one and then parentheses one credit because that is in line with everything else. And then perhaps another bullet, although I realize they're related to some extent, that said three health related learning experiences and maybe provide as um, organized annually for sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Because I do think when you look at this, it's very much not clear what a learning, a health-related learning experience is. If you say that's your graduation requirement, and it doesn't seem like it would take a lot. Alternatively, you could say wellness one, one credit if you want to keep it all together, plus three health-related learning experiences and put the asterisk there, just like you have for history, and put the asterisk down there and describe it down below what it is. I just have a, just a question. Um, and just speaking from my own experience, when a student is going through the high school experience and moving from first year to fourth year senior graduation, they're part of an experience that involves not just themselves, but um, the school counseling. And so there's probably an opportunity to do an audit from time to time to make sure they're on track for graduation. And so I'm, I'm wondering, like, even though we're trying to wordsmith this a little bit, is um, are there helping mechanisms in place that are guiding students along the way to make sure that they're in fact meeting the requirement and understanding what it means? Yes. That is one of the main functions of the guidance department. Right. So, so I, I guess my point is, yeah, I understand we're trying to get to maybe a better understanding. If I was reading this and I felt like I was responsible for doing it all myself, then it seems a little bit more uncomfortable. But if I'm meeting with my school counselor and I'm doing an audit from time to time, I'm having these discussions and I'm talking about it. I'm hoping that you know through the phys ed department and my school counselor that I'm being guided in that area to make sure that I'm meeting those requirements and being told about those opportunities. Uh, I, don't know. Um, I just want to return. I just did you want to make that as an amendment that you offered? Um, I just want. It's a suggestion, and I'm willing to listen oh, to other gonna, comments. I would be willing to second your first. Proposal, okay. if you would make it as a sure, unless Miss Busansky has an improvement before I make it. No, no, <laughs> I, I was going to add something to the conversation, but not change. Okay. It. So that I will offer an amendment if that's <laughs> okay. Sure. Which I, I'm, um, would be to make a bullet that says wellness one in parentheses one credit. Is that what you're? Yeah, that's the suggesting. And then a second, another bullet. Mr. Moore, yes, after that, exactly. that says three health-related learning experiences to be taken in grades 10 through 12. Or could they be through or 9 through 12? Which, which, which the practice? Could be 9. 9 through 12. Okay, to be taken. Take, so we don't even need that. We don't even need three that. Three school. health-related learning experiences as organized by the physical education faculty of the high school, something like that. Or just department. Department. Yes, department. whatever. Yeah, we'll leave out the something like that part. Absolutely, I'll second it. That's organized by the physical education department. The NHS, phys or I guess that's yeah. obvious. Physical education department. So you're, you'll second. I, I have seconded it. Discussion on that, Ms. Busansky. Did you want to? I just wanted to point out that we're looking at the policy, and I think that most parents actually refer to the parent handbook. So just not that, I think it's worth clarifying, and I'm in support of this amendment, but just to kind of keep that in mind. This is the policy, this is not the handbook, and that's yes. what's really important is that it's explained really kind of in those, you know, uh, understand really understandable terms for parents and students in the handbook. That was all. And I would just expand upon that, that when we are presented with the handbook to approve to make sure that it is, <laughs> in fact, the same as the language in the policy. Right. Because that's and really the key. Clear. Yeah. Okay. So we're on the amendment. Did you have a question about the amendment, Ms. Hennessy? No, good oh. point. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So we're back to the main motion, approving. Are there any other... Um, Mr. Kaufman. Quick question, Dr. Provost. Do students graduate earlier than, three, than four years at all? Not, not typically. But does it happen? I 
can't I can't remember a time when it's happened. I know that sometimes students come mid um, mid course with with uh, transcripts from other schools that might cause them to be out of sequence with the typical four year sequence, but I can't recall a single time when a student has graduated in less than four years. So where does it create any problem for you where where we have this item that says they have to stay uh, enrolled for at least four years after the completion of eighth grade? I know it's a small thing and it might not happen often, but technically, do we add a caveat to that, or are you comfortable with the way that language is, that last sentence? I'm comfortable, because I, I haven't run into a, a case where it's been a problem. If there ever was a case where it was a problem, there's a process for amending the policy. Okay. Ms. Foss? I'm good. Okay. So any other comments or questions about this revised uh, graduation policy? Because this is second reading, we will take a vote. Um, on it, and it, there's been a motion made and seconded, and all the various amendments adopted. Um, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. Aye. Uh, uh, opposed? Mm -hmm. Any abstentions? Excellent. Thank you to the committee. I know this has been a complicated one, but mm -hmm. thank you for your work on this. Next policy. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this is kind of a group of policies um, that all related to the Pregnancy Workers Fairness Act went into effect in 2018 and it amended state law to prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of pregnancy and pregnancy related conditions. Um, and so all of these policies we did um, add pregnancy or pregnancy related conditions into, um, for example, the non, we'll start with uh, policy AC, it's non-discrimination. So we just added language of um, that the Northampton public schools are committed to promoting multicultural understanding, appreciation, and harmony to ensure that no student is denied access to any educational program or other activity of the Northampton public schools for reason of um, pregnancy, pregnancy-related condition, race, color, sex, gender identity. Um, so we just added that language to the list of, um, of all the other non-discrimination um, clauses and then we while we were looking at the policy did change a bit of the language um, but it's mostly wordsmithing um, we tried to as well as we could make sure that all of these policies were aligned um, we ended up just alphabetizing um, so that we didn't want to show that we had preference for one thing over another so I think we went through and made sure that um, these were all aligned and that they all included the new language um, I don't know if you want me to go through all of them individually um, it's policy AC non-discrimination um, then policy GBA equal employment opportunity um, where we added that same list um, and pregnancy pregnancy related conditions um, policy GCF which is staff hiring um, I think the biggest change there besides adding that was to um, add in language in the second to last paragraph about how it was the policy of the school committee. Sorry, Sorry it was just really okay. distracting. Okay. Um, it's the policy of the school committee that employees will submit um, both a Commonwealth of Massachusetts background check of criminal offender records um, information um, and that they will um, also be subject to the national fingerprint-based criminal background check, um, which added in cross-references, updated legal references. Um, and then finally, I think policy JFBB, school choice, um, the only change that we made were to cross-reference it with the other policies and add in um, pregnancy, pregnancy-related conditions, and align um, the rest of the language in the same way. Do you want to make that as a motion? To well, so it's all first reading. Okay. Um, it said second okay. reading, but we um, we didn't end up getting to it on one of our longer meeting nights, okay. and so we postponed it. So this is actually just the first reading. Okay. Are there any questions about these on first reading? Okay. Um, hearing none, do we want to move on to the next set of policies? Uh, J. Fabe and J. Fab. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is the first reading as well. Under the Every Student Succeeds Act, federal law requires school districts to make accommodations um, 
for both children of active duty military families and for children placed in foster care, um, both the Federal Department of Education and the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed um, issued guidance in these areas. Um, and the MASC outlined new policies. So JFABE is Educational Opportunities for Military Children. We've adopted it largely um, as prescribed by the um, Massachusetts Association of School Committees. We uh, only changed, I think, one sentence from what was recommended initially. Um, and then for the education opportunities for children in foster care, likewise, we adopted the policy almost exactly as prescribed by or recommended by the MASC, um, adding just one word that was missing. So, um, yeah, so that's a first reading. Okay. Um, and I don't know if anyone had questions, but we did run this also by um, by Mr. Lombardi and by um, Jennifer Taller, thank you. Um, and they both gave their blessing, so. Okay. Any questions about these on first reading? Mr. Kaufman? Just really curious, in, in the past when you gave us these, Laura, you would like identify the changes, you would put in white out or yellow, did you change that for a particular reason? Oh. You would identify the changes for us, did you? Yes, know? well that, that was um, that was when Laura Judd was doing we'll it, and so doing we can start again, doing yeah. that. Okay. Um, it, yeah, it's actually hard for me too sometimes, Dream. So I've got the the chicken scratch notes. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's something we can certainly do. But um, for these policies, for the new policies, obviously there's not there aren't any changes when we're adopting adopting them almost entirely from um, the MASC. Right, I mean, when you say, yeah, I'm, when you say except for one sentence, I'm immediately going to that sentence to see if I can help. Got it. it. I mean, we should be reading the whole thing, I totally get it, and it was a little easier, but I understand. Okay, so yeah, we'll start with everything. highlighting and crossing yeah. out, and sure. making sure it's clear what the changes are. Sure, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on these on first reading? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I believe, is there any other um, items for your report? No, that's all. Thanks. Okay. So now we'll move to the um, business administrator's report and the personnel report from Ms. Lamica. So in your packet is the fiscal 19 appropriation report that was through May 3rd. Um, there's a few accounts that have deficits as of then, uh, legal services, um, special education contracted services, long-term substitutes, translations. Uh, bus mechanics, special ed transportation, vacation buyback, instruction software, building maintenance and supply accounts. Um, those are transfers that are in the process of um, re being reviewed and transfers to be made. Um, also included in your packet is um, a list of warrants that your representative has signed during the month of April. There were three of them. And we've also accepted um, five gifts from PTO. There were three from the Bridge Street PTO totaling $950 and Ryan Road PTO $500, which was in addition to the PTO donations they accepted earlier this evening. Um, and the personnel report, we have new hires. We have two ESPs. We have four bus drivers, one cafeteria assistant, and we have one clerical transfer during the month of April. One of the other items I wanted to include in the business report um, because we're also getting some, some requests, so I wanted to update the committee, is our school lunch debt balance currently is running $19,680, um, which is an increase of about $1,900 over where we ended last June 30th, so it is up slightly. We've had a couple of phone calls in the last couple of days of people who wanted to donate some funds and were inquiring about the balance. I wanted to make sure the committee had that information so it wasn't out in the public without the committee knowing about it. We are keeping an eye on it. We're sending out letters on a monthly basis. Um, we've sent out letters previously trying to collect funds and make payments arrangements, and sometimes we've succeeded and sometimes they go unanswered. Um, so we continue to keep working on that balance and trying to qualify whatever families are eligible for free and reduce whenever we can during the course of the year. So. Um, that's where we stand right now, and I will contact the people that have reached out to us about making some donations and going through that process. Thank you. Um, and you've given us the personnel reports. So. Correct. Okay, excellent. Um, now we have the superintendent's report. Thank you. 
Administrators setting out on a job search customarily begin by asking me for a letter of recommendation. Mr. Kanata did not seek out his new position. Holyoke quite literally sought him out twice. Since he never started a job search, I never had the opportunity to write him a letter of recommendation. So I'd like to take this opportunity to share some of my thoughts about Mr. Kanata and about the search for his replacement. Sal spends more time at recess than any other principal I've ever known. He's not out there just to monitor in a supervisor, although that's a part of it. He's out there to play. He has a childlike instinct for play and also even for mischief. When he's out on the playground, his students see his inner child and they connect like pals. Sal's staff and parents are also closely bonded to him. There were very few dry eyes in the room when he broke the news of his departure to his staff. And people have had a variety of responses as the news has sunk in. Some are clearing their calendars to begin work on the screening committee. Others have stepped forward to facilitate the public forums or provide school tours that we'll be scheduling for our finalists. Still others are drafting potential interview questions to be used at various points in the process. There is some anxiety for all of us. We know and love Sal, and we know we'll miss him. We don't know who will be the next to take the helm, or what that person will be like. The truth is, every personnel decision requires a leap of faith. We choose a person who has demonstrated the capacity to do the job, who others say good things about, and who is able to persuade us that they're likely to be successful. But it's only later that we learn whether or not we're happy with the choice we've made. I've chaired or played a significant role in more than a dozen administrative searches for positions such as principal director, associate director, and even once led a superintendent search. In my experience, the process has almost always resulted in a good selection being made. And I believe that will be the case in Leeds. From the paper screening to the final selection process, candidates will be sifted through many processes. The rigorous process cannot guarantee future success of any candidate, but it can ensure that a person of very high quality is selected. We will get a person of very high quality to replace Sal. I can't say whether the next person will pitch wiffle ball or play automatic quarterback, but I, and I can almost guarantee that the next person will not come equipped with beekeeping vestments. But the next principal will be someone who can uphold our core district values and extend the tremendous gains that Lead is, Leeds has made under Sal's leadership. That's my report. Thank you, Dr. Paulist. So um, the uh, next item on the agenda, um, I will just announce while we're in public session, I'll actually just make the uh, normal announcements about our future business and meeting dates. Um, we do have a rules and policy subcommittee uh, meeting scheduled in the superintendent's office at 3.30 p.m. on May 13, 2019, which I now see is canceled, so disregard that. Um, negotiating subcommittee, uh, JFK Community Room, 4.15 p.m. May 14, uh, 2019. Um, I, think that's a, I hope that's a Scrivener's error. Uh, it says 2109. Um, school committee meeting, JFK community room, 6.45 p.m., May 23rd, 2019. And school committee meeting, JFK community room, 6.45 p.m., June 13th, 2019. Um, finally, uh, we have uh, um, a request for an executive session. Um, and I would ask the, uh, the vice chair if he would make that motion for an executive session. Motion for the executive session request for an executive session under Massachusetts General Open Meeting Chapter 38, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the North End Association of School Committees, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going into executive session in Chapter 38, Section 21A2 to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union non personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. 
I want to, um, I just want to make sure that that's not a Scrivener's error. It looks like it's, um, uh, oh, it, it got doubled twice. It, it got, doubled okay. So I think we have to, I just would like to, to amend that motion. I believe it should say uh, to co conduct strategy sessions um, in preparation for, uh, strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation with non-union personnel and to conduct collective bargaining sessions with the Northampton Association of School Employees. Is I believe what that should say. I think you could actually just cut it off after non-union personnel. At the end, okay. Uh, okay. So just, but there is, th but there's no. Then it would say that we were only talking about strategy with non-union personnel, and I believe we need oh, to make yes. sure that we add that. So, um, yeah, I think it was just it just got double copied and must have uh, pasted out the other one. So. Um, Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually just restate the motion again. It's the request for an executive session under Mass General Law, open meeting, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the North, oh, here it is, Northampton Association of School Employees. We already got that in the That's first it. part. Okay, so we just need to get rid of that duplicative one at the second one. So, okay, got it. I was just concerned that we got to the end, and so I guess it doesn't, it's not a problem to recite it twice. It's fine. No, I think I think the motion as made is fine, but we just dropped that duplicative second one that was not necessary. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there a second on that motion? Okay. Um, so this requires a roll call vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, yeah, call the roll, actually. Uh, Mr. Edzikowski? Yes. Sorry. Mr. Yes. Ms. Rebecca Busanski? Aye. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Okay, so I do need to announce to the public that we now will move into an executive session um, because to conduct these uh, discussions in public would be detrimental to the school committee's bargaining possession. And I would also um, just let the public know that we will adjourn directly from executive session. We will not return to open session. Um, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>